Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me. My name is Chip Gibbons, and I'm the Policy Director for Defending Rights and Dissent. I appreciate you taking your lunchtime to spend with us for Lunchtime Live. Uh, today, I'm joined by a very special guest, my friend and investigative journalist, Tim Shirok. Uh, Tim is the author of Spies for Hire, uh, The Secret World of Intelligence Outsourcing. He has been covering the intersection of national security and capitalism since the last since the late 1970s. He's had a number of groundbreaking scoops over the years, including being one of the first journalists to report on what percent of the classified intelligence budget, the so-called black budget, goes to private contractors. He was the first journalist to interview the NSA four whistleblowers. That's uh, Bill Binney, uh, Ed Loomis, Kirk Wiebe, and Thomas Drake. He also published groundbreaking exposés of the Carlyle Group and about the AFL-CIO intervention in Chile and other countries during the Cold War. Tim has also been reporting for a long time about the legacy of US imperialism in Asia, particularly on the Korean Peninsula. And that's where our conversation is going to begin today. Uh, Tim, could you unmute yourself, please? Uh, there we go. Okay, thank you for joining us, Tim. Um, it's a real honor to have you. So recently it was the 40th anniversary of the Gwangju uprising in South Korea. And I, I'm gonna get into an, in a minute about your role and sort of uncovering the US role there. But for people who are watching at home and don't know a lot about South Korean politics, could you explain what the Gwangju uprising was and what its significance was in, in South Korean politics? Okay, I'll try to be very brief on this. Uh, well, South Korea was under authoritarian rule and dictatorship from basically from 1945 until 1979. And uh, then it was under a military dictatorship until in 1987. Uh, so a long, long time. In 1979, Park Chung-hee, the dictator who'd been in power for 18 years was assassinated by the director of his own CIA. And this came at a time of political, you know, tumult, tumult in South Korea, uh, mostly led by workers at the time. Uh, there was massive demonstrations, you know, in, in different cities and, you know, workers were going on strike and uh, there was a big, uh, precursor to what happened in Guangzhou in the city of Pusan, which is a big port in 1979. And martial law was declared, tanks were sent in, and Park Chung-hee in the middle of that was assassinated. Uh, right before Park was assassinated, the Secretary of Defense uh, of, of, Jim, of Jimmy Carter's administration was in Seoul and meeting with Park, and they had, they had basically uh, reconfigured the U.S. South Korean military alliance that had been uh, that had had numerous there had been a lot of division and political problems with the alliance, and it was restored. And so, you know, the relations between the U.S. and South Korean military were very close. And the U.S. South Korea was a huge market for U.S. goods. Uh, of course, it was a you know base for thousands of soldier, American soldiers, a strategic base in Asia for the U.S. And the U.S. was very concerned about its so-called national security interests. And so after this dictator was assassinated, there was, you know, a big push for, you know, ending dictatorship and having democracy in South Korea. And in the spring of 1980, there was began to be a series of demonstrations peaking in Seoul in early May 1980 uh, of, you know, tens of thousands of, of, you know, mostly students demanding an end to dic military dictatorship and for, for, you know, full democracy. And the U.S., you know, got really nervous about, you know, the impact of these demonstrations and the impact on, on South Korean and its own nas U.S. national security interests. And so uh, began to pressure, try to find the so-called middle way, third way between the military, the authoritarian military, and the, and, the, and the rising tide of democracy led by workers and students in the streets. And uh, they tried this. When the demonstrations continued, 
uh, the, a general who was coming up, a, a rising general who had taken over the military early after the assassination, he declared martial law and sent special forces to all the universities to stop all the demonstrations that were happening. In Guangzhou, the special forces attacked, began to attack people in the most brutal way you can imagine, kicking people to death, beating them to death, stabbing them to death with bayonets, not just students and demonstrators, but just onlookers, people in the streets, citizens. And after this went on for three days, these paratroopers viciously attacked people. There's a complete news blackout. No one, you know, people in the city could only knew what happened through rumors or, or if they were there. People outside of the city knew nothing about what was happening. And uh, after three days of this murderous conduct by these special forces meant to enforce martial law, uh, people, thousands of people, you know, rose in the streets and taxi drivers and bus drivers you know, began to use whatever weapons they could against against the military. And they, were, they, they surrounded the military. And then the, finally on May 21st, 1980, the military opened fire with, with their M16s and dozens and dozens of people were just mowed down in the, in the street in, in Guangzhou city. And the people after that happened, went to nearby police stations and, and got guns and and uh, and you know fought back, and they they took the city. The military pulled out, and they held the city for seven days. And this was known, kind of you know now known as like the Guangzhou Commune. People poured out in the streets, fed the fed the rebel troops, you know fed fed you know provided rice and water to the uh, people who had seized the guns, the citizens' army that had taken over, and there was an attempt. Uh, by them to negotiate with the military authorities and also to try to get the U.S. Embassy to mediate. U.S. Embassy refused. May 22nd, one day after this massacre happened, the U.S. Uh, the, the White House, the U.S. officials met and they decided to throw U.S. support to the dictator and help him crush this rebellion, which they did. The U.S. sent aircraft carriers and, and reconnaissance planes to the area to help Managed the whole military operation, and they retook the city, crushed the rebellion, and South Korea remained under dictatorship for another seven years until there was another nationwide protest, and they finally won their right to have you know direct one person one vote democracy and vote directly for president, and after that, that was when democracy finally came to South Korea, not with any help from the U.S. but Yes. by their own hands. So what, what about your background initially led you to be interested in the story? Well, I lived in South Korea as a kid. My father was a, ran a church relief NGO that distributed relief supplies to Korea, South Korea after the Korean War. And I was there at the first uprising, the democratic uprising in 1960, when they overthrew the dictator Sigmund Rhee. I was I was nine years old, but I, you know, I kept a record of it, uh, cutting out newspapers, and I was really astonished. It was my first lesson in direct democracy, really. You know, this is how a revolution happens. You know, people go out in the streets, and it had a huge impression on me. So, and I knew the history of, you know, Korea after the Korean War. Uh, so, so, you know, I, that's, it, 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 and at the time of the Kwangju uprising, I was actually in graduate school studying modern Korean history yeah. and writing about the labor movement in South Korea. That's what my thesis was about labor. And in front of me, uh, you know, there began to be this huge labor movement rising up to try to force, uh, change the country so there could be a democratic system. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so I was following it very closely and, and, uh, and it was something I knew a lot about. And then when I heard the lies being told by the U.S. about why they had, why they needed to crush this rebellion, and and the excuses they made for what the Korean military did. I really wanted to find out, you know, what the truth was and what had happened, and that's what led me to 
uh, file this sort of massive freedom of information request that I made in the early 1990s. So, so let's talk about, about the FOIA request. If people go to your website, there are 4,000 declassified documents. On it's not all up there yet, but but a lot. Okay. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, yes. I, I, I obtained about four thousand documents from State Department, National Security Council, and the CIA, and the Defense Intelligence Agency as well, DOD. And you filed your first FOIA request in nineteen ninety one, right? Yeah, nineteen ninety one. And when did you receive the last of the documents? About two thousand six, two thousand seven. This has been a long, a long journey for you, then. Yes. Yes. Very long. Yes. So what kinds of things did we, what have been the impact of the release of these documents? What, how they changed or shifted the narrative? Well, two things. They really showed the efforts that were made in between the assassination and the uprising in Guangzhou, how the U.S., what the U.S. told the Korean government and the South Korean military, and how they were trying to you know, uh, pressure the sort of, the, you know, the, these, these militant, you know, mil the militarists and the, and the military who wanted to crush any kind of democracy movement and the, 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 the you know, the people, the, 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 the sort of pro-U.S. people in the government that wanted a little, you know, moderate their authoritarian rule and, uh, you know, maintain security as they considered it. So, one, the doc, you know, for, for, for example, uh, this one document I got showed that the U.S. ambassador had met with the, you know, the, the uh, South Korean general who was responsible for Guangzhou. He met with him like 10 days before martial law and communicated to him instructions from Washington, from the highest levels of the Carter administration, that the U.S. will not object if you use military of uh, troops to quell these demonstrators and and so that was a that was seen as a green light uh of the u.s to south korean military to, to crack down on these demonstrations uh so that was one finding but the key finding i had was this meeting that happened on may 22nd at the white house where it spelled out that you know they knew that there had been all this violence inflicted on civilians Yet they decided, you know, they, they decided to support the Korean military's put down uh, suppression of the uprising uh, because the, the, the justification was we'll support them in, in the short term, the military, but in the long term, we will pressure them for more democracy. And uh, that, though, that stark decision uh, really showed that the U.S. Uh, had helped uh, to suppress the rebellion. And, and they actually, you know, then later it turned out uh, that in, in, in parliamentary uh, hearings in South Korea, uh, that the U.S. had actually asked the South Korean military uh, to, to hold off on retaking the city uh, until the U.S. could get all its military assets in place. And that, and that was also spelled out in this, in this, uh, in this document. Uh, so those were, you know, and, and the impact of that knowledge on South Korea was immense. Uh, I never really knew how, how the effect it had until years later when I was, you know, I was told by people, including the current president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, you know, the impact because people really, uh, they, they understood you know, the, the hypocrisy of the United States in a way that w had not been clear before. And they really felt the betrayal very strongly. And it, and it really helped the South Korean left develop their, their analysis of the United States and its, and its true objectives in Korea. And you know, I was told that by many, many people in, in, in South Korea. And, you know, and I, was, I was, you know, given an honorary citizenship by the city of Kwangju for, for exposing that. So uh, recently it was the 40th anniversary of the Kwangju uprising. You co-authored a piece in The Nation called Two Days in May that Chattered Korean Democracy. And you said in it, the response to the dictatorship repression by the US was even worse than we thought. What have been sort of the most recent developments 
about the U.S. role and, and what do we know now that we didn't know before? Well, my partner and I, uh, Kim In Jong, who's a, who's a reporter uh, who worked, in, who was a reporter in Guangzhou for many years. She's now uh, at, the UC, at UC Berkeley in, in the journalism program. But, but she, uh, we worked together on a couple of documentaries. And in one, in one of these documentaries, we interviewed a very senior Pentagon official who was the aide to uh, Secretary of Defense Brown uh, 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 at, the, at, the, at the time. Uh, and he was in that meeting, that very critical meeting on May, May 22nd. And from his notes, which he gave to us and read to us, uh, he took very careful notes uh, for the Secretary of Defense in this meeting. Those notes show that the U.S. knew that the, the day before they met, this fateful day of May 22nd in Guangzhou, May 21st in Guangzhou, that at least 60 people had been killed, shot to death by the Korean military. They knew that. They also knew that Chun Doo Hwan, the general who had led the martial law takeover and was responsible for what happened in Guangzhou, they knew that he was the man. He, they knew that he was the guy responsible. So they knew that this dictator had killed in cold blood 60 people, yet they still decided uh, to, to put down this uprising, which they called you know, a riot, uh, just like officials call what happens in our streets riots when they're you know, demonstrations of people against oppression. And uh, so you know, that story really laid out the, the, the utter hypocrisy of the, of the US and what it was saying publicly and what it was actually you know, doing behind the scenes. And we talked to other people, we talked to the uh, commanding general at the time, Wickham, you know, who, who told us that he had you know, helped plan the, you know, he had given them advice about which troops to use when they retook the city and you know, this kind of thing. So, and that article, by the way, is it's, it's about to be published in South Korea at Hong Kyo Day 21, which is, Hong Kyo Day is a very, progressive daily newspaper and has a magazine that's very well read in, in South Korea. Uh, so that's going to get some big play once once it's uh, published. So right now in the United States, we're witnessing sort of a nationwide uprising against white supremacy, against state violence, against police brutality. Obviously, it's a very different context than a military dictatorship. The degree of repression is different. But do you think there's any sort of lessons from Guangzhou that American activists right now could learn? Well, for one thing, it's, it's just, you know, having cell phones and the internet and Twitter, that, that kind of communication is so critical for shedding light. I mean, you know, people have compared, you know, what happened in, you know, Minneapolis with, with, with uh, you know, what happened when, when uh, the mother of Emmett Till showed his body, you know, like, this is what happens. And so that's one, that's one thing. Korea at the time, th there was no internet and there was no information. People, and many, many people in South Korea did not know about what happened in Guangzhou for years and years uh, because of this complete media blackout. But the other thing that's in, that, that I've seen that kind of was scary to me, being in DC and seeing you know, the way that the Trump administration and his own attorney general we're using all the levers of power to put down this movement. You know, like, it, I think it's important to look back, like, you know, a few months ago, you know, Trump has been, put his own people up in charge of the intelligence agencies, right? The, you know, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, he's put his own hack in there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, Barr has been able to, you know, manipulate all these agencies under, Justice Department and under that are domestic agencies and 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 you know send them into DC along with military. So you know it, it was kind of frightening to see sort of a similar pattern happening. I mean this was you know really what happened in DC on June first and after. I've been here for 38 years. I have never seen U.S. military forces surrounding a demonstration. And, uh, it, you know, the fact is that there was, you know, this division, uh, this rapid re response force 
from the U.S. Army was to, you know just across the river in Fort Belvoir, which, which wasn't wasn't used, but they were ready to come in. Uh, you know, and in that division's last deployment was to Baghdad. I I found when I was you know you know researching all this what, what was happening. So I think you know the lessons are you know one is just you know get the get the word out. That's that's always that's so so important. But also watching the ways that authoritarian leaders can use various levers of the government that they know about. And, you know, what I wrote about Barr was, of course, you know, he knew about, you know, he's been an expert. He's been in the middle of domestic, you know, illegal domestic surveillance for, for decades. You know, he started one of the first domestic spy programs where they're spying on people's telephone calls back when he was working for the Bush administration uh, in the in the nineties when he was attorney general for the senior Bush, so you know he he knows how to use all these levers of power, and and how they can be deployed, and you know you see similar patterns with military coups in South Korea and other places too. Yeah, I mean we were extremely disturbed about Barr when he was nominated as attorney general. We along with uh, Just Foreign Policy, circulated a letter highlighting sort of his very disturbing views, not just on executive power, but on executive war powers. He lobbied George H.W. Bush, telling him that he did not need congressional authorization to attack Iraq during the first Gulf War, which was a, a fringe view at the time. He advanced this very disturbing thing called the bootstrap theory, Whereas even though Bush could attack Iraq all he wanted to, that he could also put U.S. troops nearby and then claim that Saddam was going to attack them with chemical weapons. He was taking a preventative strike to prevent that. So put U.S. troops in harm's way and then say, oh, we have to start a war in order to protect them. Very, very cynical manipulation of of U.S. foreign policy. So you mentioned your most recent article, how Bill Barr became Trump's generalismo. Uh, is there anything else about Barr's uh, background you want to let us know about before we sort of close things off today? Or? Well, I thought it was amusing reading the stories about him at the Columbia, famous Columbia strike in 1968, <laughs> which, you know, anyone who was around then or has read about it knows that was, a, that was a huge event and a turning point, actually, for the left and the SDS in this country. And, you know, one of their targets in Columbia was this sort of think tank for the military that was you know, working and, you know, you know, helping the U.S. fight the war in Vietnam and providing information to the U.S. military and the CIA in Vietnam, you know, to kill Vietnamese, you know, liberation fighters. And, of course, you know, Barr was there. Uh, you know, his, his father had been the precursor, in, had been in the CIA before there was a CIA. Uh, and he was a student there studying Chinese, you know, politics. And he was against these demonstrations and he you know was part of this gang of of uh upper class thugs that would you know try to beat up some of these leftist demonstrators and so it, it showed me this guy's been on the war path against the left and the popular movement here for his whole life basically he has a very very disturbing history i mean jeff sessions when he was nominated for attorney general i think everyone knew how odious he was because he was very uh, out front and center with sort of his gross, racist, authoritarian views, whereas Barr has, I think, maybe slipped a little bit more under the radar, but his decades-long career in, in the surveillance state is troubling, and I think that's right. has enabled him to, as you say, be the mastermind of the D.C. crackdown. And we, still well. don't, we, and we still don't know. I mean, there's been questions asked by Congress about these surveillance planes and drones that were flying around DC, Minneapolis, and other cities. Who gave, who wrote the legal order for that? And what kind, you know, are they, are they using classified intelligence and sending it to police? I, I, I would think so under Barr, but we, that's something that I think really needs to be understood. And there's been, you know, there's been some press coverage of that, but to me, that's one of the scariest aspects of this. Yeah, that, no. we're, that we're under mass surveillance and we don't even know, don't know about it. Yeah, and you know, Congress should be doing oversight. They have subpoena power, but it oftentimes falls on whistleblowers to a great personal risk. 
to, to expose. I know you've written about the crackdown on whistleblowers. It's been one of our top concerns at Defending Rights in Dissent has been the grotesque escalation of using the Espionage Act against people of conscience who expose government misconduct. So Congress really needs to step up their game here. I think that's not really in debate. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you as always. I assume I'll see you in the streets again sometime soon. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you watching at home, thank you for spending your lunch with us. Uh, I just wanna let you know at Defending Rights in Ascent, we've been doing an ongoing podcast called Still Spying, which focuses on the history and legacy of FBI political surveillance. About two weeks ago, we released the first episode, which featured former FBI agent Mike German, as well as a history of the FBI's uh, political surveillance. On Monday, we're gonna be dropping the next episode. It's going to be about the failure to reform the FBI. I will go over some of the attempts to reform the FBI, including an incident that occurred when the FBI arrested someone for passing on secret FBI documents and then had to put those documents in court, which uncovered that the FBI was engaging in political surveillance. And as a result of this, the conviction was thrown out because the FBI had to concede they were spying on this person's attorney. Uh, and we'll also speak to Emily Berman, a Defending Rights and Dissent board member and uh, law professor about what the current FBI guidelines are. And they are shockingly lackadaisical in protecting your right to engage in free speech and not be spied on. You can see more about that on our website, which is rightsandissent.org. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be back uh, next week with another one of these programs focusing on the bad cop list in DC. Tim, pleasure to see you. Thank you very much.